Today's lesson is on the effective nuclear charge, and that is the net charge that the nucleus has on the electrons. And usually we're talking about the net charge on the outer electrons. And this is an important concept because it will determine the size of an atom as well as how reactive an atom is. So let's look at the factors that affect the net nuclear charge. Well, we have two things going on here. We have protons in the nucleus. The more protons, the higher the attractive force. But except for hydrogen, we also have electrons, electrons outside the nucleus. And when electrons interact with other electrons, they repel each other. And if these electrons happen to be between the outer electrons and the nucleus, then they provide a high amount of shielding. They're in the way. So in addition to a positive attractive force, you also have a negative repelling force. So the net nuclear charge is this approximate difference between these two, between the positive charge that's pulling the electron towards the nucleus and the negative charge which is repelling the outer electrons. Now some electrons shield better than others and that's if the electrons get in the way, get between the nucleus and the outer electrons. So let's remind ourselves what orbitals look like. So here we have a boron atom and I'm going to make it a little simpler and take some of these away. And we're going to look at the electrons. And here we have electrons in the form of dots and this represents the orbitals or the highest probability of where the electrons will be. So if we just have one electron, it's in the 1s orbital and that's this spherical shape. And the dots show you that the probability that the electron is here is very high and less high out here. If we add a second electron to this atom, it also occupies the 1s orbital. And these electrons interact and they repel each other, okay? but they're also being attracted to the nucleus. There's a slight repelling going on here. But what about if I have a third electron? If I have a third electron, notice the inner electrons are now in between the 2s orbital and the nucleus, which is here right at the middle. So these really shield, they get in the way. Shielding is like getting in the way. They get in the way of this outer electron and the nucleus. So this electron does not feel that big of a attraction because it has two protons pulling it in, I mean sorry, three protons pulling it in and two electrons pushing it out. So the net effect is much smaller. What if I add another electron? The next electron also goes in the 2s orbital. Here, once again, they have electrons in the 1s orbital which are kind of blocking or shielding the attractive forces between the outer electrons and the inner electrons. And then let's add one more electron that goes in the 2p orbital and notice this is why I'm not drawing again this time. So here's our 2p orbital. You can see it's in purple here and here. And notice once again the most shielding comes from the 1s orbital. The 2s and the 2p occupy similar regions of space but the 1s is really in between. So the 1s orbital is still blocking the weight or shielding the net effect of the nucleus. So let's look at some numbers. So what does this mean? So we saw those pictures, but what does it really mean? So let's look at this. And let's look even closer. So here we have the periodic table and as we can see now that we're a little closer, that hydrogen has one proton and it has an effective nuclear charge of one. Why? Because it doesn't have any other electrons that are repelling this electron. 
but then I go across this way, I get two protons. I don't have a charge of two anymore because I have a little repelling going on, but it's close to two. It's about 1.7 effective nuclear charge. Then I drop to the next row and I get to lithium. It has three protons, but now it's dropped. It's much less than helium, which had 1.7. What happened here? Well, what happened was this 1s uh, orbital is in the way between the 2s orbital and the nucleus. So increased shielding when I jump an energy level. What happens now? I go up to beryllium. I have four protons. I have some more shielding, but it's more the effective nuclear charge is more than lithium. Why? Because I've added a proton and I haven't added a lot more shielding. Same thing as I go this way. I add a proton, so I increase, 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 because each time I'm adding a proton, and I'm adding some shielding, but not a lot. But what happens if I jump down another row? I go from 5.7 or 5.8 down to 2.5 now. What happened? Why did it drop off so much? because of the increased shielding. Because now the 3s orbital has the 2 energy level and the 1 energy level in the way, shielding it from the nucleus. So I drop dramatically. When I go across, notice I get higher and higher. Why? Because I'm adding more protons. I'm also adding shielding, but not dramatically until I jump a row and then once again a dramatic drop. Why? Because these are in the way between the nucleus and the outer orbital. So let's kind of summarize that. As you go across from left to right the periodic table, the effective nuclear charge increases. But when you start a new row, it drops again. Then it increases and then you drop and then it increases and then it drops. And that's because of the increased shielding every time you start a new energy level. If you note carefully, there are some unusual things happening at the transition metals, but we're not going to go into that detail now, but they are kind of interesting. So there you have it, the effective nuclear charges and the trends on the periodic table. Thanks for listening.